Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to The Strand tonight. My name is Peter, and I help to direct the events here. Uh, for a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Ben Bass over on what was then 4th Avenue's Book Row, stretching from Astor Place to Union Square. Uh, Bro Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I am very excited to be welcoming Monique Trong to discuss her latest novel, The Sweetest Fruits. Described by The New Yorker as an act of reclamation and redemption, The Sweetest Fruits examines the lives of three women in their own words, relating their experiences with Lovkadio Hearn, the 19th century globetrotter, best known for his books about Meiji-era Japan, and expanding on their own remarkable existences alongside the real-life travelers. It builds on Mo Monique's work in two previous novels, The Book of Salt and Bitter in the Mouth, which have been published in 15 countries and seen her receive the Penn Robert Bingham Fellowship, the New York Public Library Young Lions Award, the Asian American Literary Award, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Family Foundation Award, among other honors. I'm also thrilled that Will Schwalbe is here with Monique to discuss her work. Will is a Strand Events alum and the author of the New York Times bestseller, The End of Your Life Book Club, Books for Living, and Send, Why People Email So Badly and How to Do It Better, which I and many other people that I work with uh, could use. He's also an editor, the founder of Cookster.com, and the host of the podcast, but that's another story. Uh, please join me in welcoming Will, Monique, and the sweetest fruits to the Strand. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so it's uh, so delightful to be here. When um, I heard there was an opportunity to talk in public with Monique and ask her questions about her spectacularly gorgeous novel, um, I waited about one eighteenth of a second before I said, yes, please. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, what we're going to do is uh, Monique's going to read a little passage so you can hear the vo one of the voices of the book in her voice. Uh, then I'm going to ask her a whole bunch of questions, and then I'm going to open it up so you can ask questions. Um, I will say just before I start that um, I had the privilege of first meeting Monique when she was still a college student. Um, but later had the immense privilege of being uh, her fellow board member at the Asian American Writers Workshop. And there are some other people in the house associated with Asian American Writers Workshop um, in the past and present, so big shout out to AAWW. Now, Monique, reading. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Doesn't, doesn't seem... It doesn't sound powerful. I think my own voice is more powerful than this thing. Aww. Oh, for recording purposes. Okay. Okay. This is a little bit better, yeah? Okay. So I thought I would just begin by um, reading from essentially the first page of the novel. It's in the voice um, of... Um, uh, Lafcadio Hearn, who's the subject of this novel. Lafcadio is um, a half Greek, half Irish writer who lived from 1850 to 1904. And um, this is essentially his story, but told from the point of view of three women in his life. Um, a fourth, if you count um, Elizabeth Beeslin, his first biographer, whose work I also excerpt. Um, and use as the framework for this. So um, we'll talk more about it, but this, uh, this begins with Rosa. And Rosa is uh, Lafcadio's mother, and she is on a ship uh, on the Irish Sea, and she is sailing away from Dublin, Ireland, uh, heading back to the Ionian Islands, and she has left Hearn, who's um, four years old, and she's never going to see him again. And the date is 1854. Patricio Lafcadio Hearn was born hungry. I could tell by the way that he suckled from the first time that his mouth found the nipple, he was not wont to let it go. His eyes opened and unblinking, watching and daring me to tug myself from him. 
All babies were born with an empty stomach, but not all of them were born with such need in their eyes. His elder brother, Giorgio, my first blessed one, had to be coaxed and tricked. The tip of my little finger dipped in honey was what he took first into his rosebud mouth. Then patiently, I would guide him to my breast where honey and milk would mix. This soothed him, but it was not enough to keep him. Giorgio shared my milk with Patricio for less than two months. I beg of you, do not call them George and Patrick. Those are not their names. Their father's language is not mine. Even before I was certain that there would be a blessed second, I suffered his appetite, which was growing in me swift and strong. Patricio demanded of me the small things from the sea, whelks which no one sold because the people on Santa Maura, same as on Sarago, the island where I was born, would not buy something that they could gather like pebbles at the shore. In the mornings, I would leave my first with old Iota, the only woman on our lane with no children of her own in order to bend over the wet sand until I felt lightheaded or until my basket was full. Patricia wanted the whelks boiled, their spiral of flesh removed one by one. He allowed me olive oil and lemon juice with them, but never vinegar. When there was no longer a doubt and whelks became too difficult for me to collect, Patricio insisted on cockles, of which there were sellers, because cockles were found on the sandbars far from shore, where the tide came in like the hand of God. To lose your life for mere cockles is a curse as old as the sea and may you never hear it spoken. So breathtaking. Um, we are going to start right in with the title. Okay. Um, the Book of Salt. Yes. Bitter on the tongue, the sweetest fruit. Why flavors and why sweet? Okay. Well, I love the name Bitter on the Tongue, but the novel was actually oh. called Bitter in the Mouth. Bitter in the Mouth, sorry. But I wish I had <laughs> talked to you first <laughs> before I named it. Because that's catchy, Will. Thank you. <laughs> that's the sequel. Right, I know. Editor right here, right? I know. Um, well, um, why flavors? Well, because one, I love food. I'm actually, the word love is too um, weak. <laughs> the word I would use is I'm, I am obsessed and, and I am always thinking about food. Um, and so I, I do think that there is, um, that's a very big, uh, delicious lens that I use to look at the world. You know, I, I understand the world best through cooking and, and, and food history and, um, and hunger, right? But why the sweetest fruits? Um, I, when I started to um, do the research about Hearn, um, one of the things that I noted was that um, <laughs> he wrote these very simple letters in Japanese to his wife, Setsu. And I had um, a translation of the letters. And he would sometimes sign off by saying, sweet wife, or he would say, dear sweet wife. Now, I'm not quite sure if it is a direct 
you know, translation or not. But it, it stayed with me, this notion of the sweet wife. And then that, um, you know, made me think about how that word sweet is used uh, and applied to women, right? We are sweet, meaning that we're simple. We are sweet, meaning that we can be dismissed and sub, sub, you know, uh, subservient. And so I really wanted to, to take that word and, and reclaim it for women and for women's stories. Well, I'm glad I asked that. <laughs> now, there are three extraordinary women in this book, and four if you count the biographer who provides the interstitial material. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, which of the women did you identify with the most, and which of the women are you most like? Gosh. Um, or did you most like? I mean. Oh, d that I most liked. And who did you most identify with? Ah, wow. I think... I, and this is such a dis disappointing answer, at least to me, but I think I'm most identified with Hearn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the writer, right? The one who's constantly in search of something, trying constantly to find something that he felt is missing from his life and has lived in many places in the world. You know, um, and as I think, I mean, maybe not you will because you are actually a nice human being. <laughs> but I think that most writers are actually rather selfish, and you have to be. You know, your craft is your is your first priority, and often the, your beloveds, the people around you, take second position, right? So in that way, I really did. You know felt that I was more Hearn than Rosa or Alethea or Setsu. Now, let me just back up and sort of, um, so Rosa is his um, Ionian Islander mother. The Ionian Islands are now part of Greece. Um, but then they were a colony of the, of the British. And uh, Alethea is his, uh, is Lafcadio's first wife, and she's African American. She was born uh, into slavery in the state of Kentucky, and, and post Civil War, she moved to Ohio, and that's where they met in Cincinnati, Ohio. She was a um, a cook in the boarding house where Hearn stayed. And then there is Setsu, and Setsu is his Japanese wife, his second wife, whom he met in Matsue, Japan, which is now part of Shimane Prefecture. And, um, and she is the mother of his four children, and sh she is also um, very much his unsung literary collaborator. She told him many, many of the stories that eventually made him uh, known in the West as an expert on Japanese folklore, uh, ghost stories, and fairy tales. Um, I mean, certainly she was not the only collaborator, but there were definitely, she had a very significant role to play. Um, and I would say that of those three women, I like Alethea the best. <laughs> Because Alethea is a cook. We belong to the same, <laughs> you know, um, kind of uh, community, I feel, right? I lived in Ohio. I lived in southern Ohio in Dayton. Dayton, Ohio? No? No, no. No, no one can give a little hoot for that. <laughs> but, um, and also, she really, I think, had a, a I, perhaps I should say, I understood her best because of, of, because I suppose I understand American history best, right? And um, one of the things that drew me to Alethea was that in 1906, this is two years after Hearn had passed, she found out that Hearn didn't leave her any money. 
even though they were still married, right? And he had left all of his estate, he was a known, well-known writer by now, um, to his Japanese wife. And she actually filed um, papers in, in probate court to, to basically declare that she was married to Hearn, right? And when you think of an African-American woman in 1906 who did not have access to the written word, having the will and the strength to, to bring her claim to a court of law, the moment I read that, I was like, I'm with you, Alethea, take me where you want. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, now, I want to quote from a rave from the Washington Post, um, which praised the way you, quote, with great generosity and compassion, explore the difference between writing and telling stories with the question of who gets to speak and who remains silent. Mm. Can you talk about this? Sure. Um, well, you know, Alethea and Rosa, the mother, um, both did not have access to the written word. And I, I prefer to phrase it in that way as opposed to saying that they were illiterate. Because um, illiterate is what you become, <laughs> what you are labeled as when you do not have access to, to um, an education. And they didn't have access for different reasons, right? Rosa came from, you know, from all accounts, a minor noble family. And she had brothers who went to Italy to go to school, but she was, I, I did not make up the fact that she did not have access to the written word. This is historical fact. That, and, and that was actually eventually used against her by Lafcadio Hearn's father, who basically, uh, when he wanted a divorce, he went to court and said, this marriage contract is null and void. This woman didn't know what she was signing, right? <laughs> um, and, and then you have Alethea, who could not uh, learn how to read and write because during the Civil War, that was against the law in the South. So um, to me, uh, I, I needed them to, to, well, I needed them. <laughs> I needed them to, be, to have a reason and a context for telling their stories. And this is what you get in The Sweetest Fruits, is that they're actually telling their story to a scribe. And Setsu also does that as well, but for different reason. I'll get to her next, but... Um, you know, to me, the first person voice is the most compelling, you know, and um, because I, I think of my characters' language, their vocabulary, their syntax, their, their, you know, quirks, their repetitions, all of that as, as a way that tells me about their character. And I know that some writers might think, oh, you have that ass backwards, <laughs> you know? You have to understand your characters and then you can understand their language. But I think we reach our characters, you know, in different ways, and that's mine. And so when I, I think of my characters, they are talking to me. They are talking to you, the reader, right? So my question is always, in addition, why are they telling their stories? Why? do they want to share it with, with the reader? You know, so I, I tried to pinpoint these moments in each of these women's lives where they feel the need to be documented and to be heard. Um, and um, with Rosa, uh, she's on the ship. She's leaving her son. And so she's telling it to a, to a younger woman who can read and write. And the idea is, she's, is she is creating a letter for Hearn so that when he is older, he can understand why she made this 
decision, yeah? With Alethea, it's, she is giving a interview to a reporter in 1906 as she has, you know, um, is about to file or has just filed her papers with the probate court. And that I did not make up, which is amazing to me, that she, there is a um, Cincinnati Inquirer uh, news article from 1906 that is telling uh, Alethea's story, right? Um, and so, but th the moment I saw that document, I thought, what did the reporter leave out? What did Alethea want to communicate and, and drive home, um, but was left, you know, from that article? So what's on in The Sweetest Fruits is, is that essentially that unedited sort of narrative that Alethea is, is sharing. And then with Setsu, Setsu is, um, is um, she is, of course, has, well, not of course, but in Setsu's case, she could read and write in Japanese. But um, one of the things that I found about the way that she was written about in the West is that the biographers would emphasize that she was illiterate in English. <laughs> you know, as if no other language <laughs> was applicable in the world, especially Japan, Meiji era. <laughs> you know, and in, of course, when you stop and think about it, you understand that in many ways, Setsu had a linguistic advantage in day-to-day -day life to Hearn, the great man of letters, you know. So, but what, what is going on with Setsu's voice is that she's actually addressing Hearn he is, um, he has passed away, but she's telling him about a project that she's been working on, which is to write her memoir of her life with Hearn. And it's for a very particular reason, which is to essentially generate income for the family, right? And she was never comfortable with her, her written, uh, with her calligraphy, let's say. And, and so she's telling her story to, um, to someone else, and he's writing it down. And what I know, and what you know, eventually happens to this story is that it gets translated into English, right? So she, in a way, she's also in, in, a, um, in a compromised, you know, um, relationship to the written word because of that translation that will occur. Um, right, so telling versus writing. And who gets remembered? Of course, the writer. Yes. There's, in the, the story of Setsu uh, and uh, Lafcadio, when he's in Japan, there was a sentence that really uh, pulled me up short in a marvelous scene, and I, I no spoilers, so don't worry, um, where, um, if I remember right, uh, Lafcadio jumps in the water, and um, she wants to shout out, he is the foreigner, not me. But she doesn't say it because she says it was perhaps no longer true. Yeah. And can you talk about the theme of being a foreigner? Yeah. Right. Um, so that scene, they are in a, you know, Hearn loved the, what he uh, would term the unfamiliar Japan. So he loved, you know, going into the small fishing villages where they've never seen um, another Westerner. And this was basically the context, right? Um, and... The reason why Setsu says that, you know, she, she questions whether, in fact, he's the only foreigner now, right? Because the moment that she joined her life with Hearn, she became an outsider. She became a very particular kind of despised outsider, which was the mistress or the lover of uh, a white man, a you know, a Westerner. 
and within her town of Matsue, she, she became known as that. <laughs> you know, um, her, her, um, she came from a very noble family, um, noble in the sense that they, they belong to the former samurai class. So it's not necessarily noble, but from the very particular class of um, the samurai. But by the Meiji era, that was over with, and, and her family was destitute, like many samurai, former samurai families. And so when she joined her life with Hearn, she was no longer part of Japanese society the way that she was before. And one of the things that she says, well, right, is that she says that she and Hearn belong to the country inside. Right, and that Japan was the country outside. And I believe that to be very much true, that they together formed their own sort of um, land, their own sense of, of belonging, and it was within their home. And I think sometimes that's all we have, right? And, and to me, um, it, it kind of also goes hand in hand with something else that I found incredibly fascinating about her and, and Setsu's relationship, which is that they didn't have a shared language because when they met, Hearn didn't have Japanese and Setsu did not have English. And together, they, um, they used uh, or formulated for each other um, what scholars now and biographers of Hearn call Hearn's language, right? And they always, I swear, from every scholar who's from the West will attribute it to Hearn alone. And if any of you are in a long-term relationship, you know that's bull. Because no, no relationship you know, that can last as long as Hearn and Setsu's is, is, can be, um, can be so one-sided. It's always a negotiation. It's always a collaboration. And certainly, certainly Setsu was part of that creation of this very personal language, domestic, uh, language that it was only spoken within the country inside. So before I open it up to questions from everybody, I want to ask you a, a practical question about the creation of the book. The sense of place is so vivid, Lefkada, Ireland, Cincinnati, New Orleans, Japan. I'm curious what travel, if any, did you do for research on this book? Right. Um, I began by traveling to Lefkada, the island where um, Hearn was born. And um, one of the things I realized when I was there was that I was seeing a landscape and a seascape that Hearn himself didn't remember because he left it at the age of two. And for all the places that Hearn traveled to in the world as an adult, he went to the West Indies, you know, he, um, he was in France, he was in England, of course the US, he never sought out that island. And that seemed to me very, somehow, um, maybe, at first I think of it as being sad, but I think it, maybe it's more realistic that that home or that place is no longer because his mother isn't there, you know. But um, the parts of Cincinnati, Ohio, that I write about are the parts that were predominantly African-American, meaning that they were the segregated parts. Um, and Bucktown, uh, the Levy, none of that is really physically present anymore. Um, but Cincinnati, I don't know if you know, is the hog capital of the US. <laughs> no? 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know when you grow up in Ohio, these things. But um, And then um, Japan, I, I got a three-year fellowship to be a three years. Gosh, <laughs> I wish, exactly. Three-month fellowship. And um, I went to Matsue, where Hearn met uh, Satsu. And, um, and then um, most of the time I was in Tokyo. Um, and that was really there is where I fully understood how dependent Hearn must have been on Setsu on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there are, of course, there's a lot of English speakers, much more so than the first time I went there in 86, but still there are pockets and, and certainly little bars or restaurants where there's no English spoken. And, you know, he needed a friend. He needed, if it's not Setsu, then someone else. He wasn't the lone wolf, you know, the great man of letters that, that I think a lot of um, Western male straight writers like to uh, remember him as. Great. So I'm not going to be so greedy anymore and allow some other people to ask questions. Um, but anybody have a question? I'll re-shout it back. Yes, Jessica. I, I think I asked this when you first told me you were going to write this book. But, you know, it's a real basic question, but I think it fascinates me. What drew you to me? Um, well, what drew me to him? I think uh, one is that he wrote a cookbook. <laughs> I'm so predictable. <laughs> um, when he first lived in Cincinnati, and then um, he uh, moved to New Orleans, and he lived there for, I think it was around 10 years. And in New Orleans, he wrote what is known as the first Creole cookbook to be published in the United States, and it's called La Cuisine Creole. And, and the book is, is totally, totally a product of its time. He writes things like, men are better cooks than women because they're more scientifically minded and, you know, are, are able to measure. <laughs> like, really? It's all about the measuring, eh? <laughs> um, so, you know, I've there. I, I can't remember where I said this, but essentially, the moment I read that cookbook, I just wanted to get into a big old fight with him. <laughs> you know, some cookbooks make you want to cook. Some make you hungry. This one, yeah. And then you know how novelists fight. Jessica, we write books about people. <laughs> yeah. But still, that doesn't quite. Okay, but like I never knew you'd written this cookbook. Right? Yeah. Until your book. But so, but what drew you to him in particular? There were so many fascinating writers out there. Yeah. Was it the like ghost stories? Did you grow up reading them? We had them in the Philippines. Really? Yeah, that's I read it as a few. I've met a few. I didn't know who he was at all. You met a few ghosts, Luis? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. I, I think um, as I started to find out more about his biography, I understood that what he did was he did the reverse journey that I had. You know, he went from the west to the east, and he... Um, I, as a, you know, as a, a former refugee and as a refugee who came here as a child, I am always drawn to the stories of people who willingly leave their home, who willingly leave their language, you know, because I know how absolutely painful and excruciating and difficult that is. Um, and it, I could not imagine why people do this. And every time I hear of these stories, I'm drawn to them. And of course, I'm also drawn to the fact that, you know, here he was, this, this white man who was considered an expert on Japanese culture. I really wanted to know, was he an expert, right? 
are what what other interventions were around him to allow him this authority, this author authoritative voice? Yeah. <laughs> Louise? Well, you know, I think there's also a tradition in Japan where the voice from the outside is kind of looked at and respected. Uh, I mean, there's a whole subset of books written about Japanese culture by Westerners that become yeah. bestsellers. Yeah, like so, Donald Richard. Yeah, yeah. So I think Kern is a kind of pioneer in that sense. He sets the template. And of course, it's a patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. So, and he's a Westerner. Japan has opened up the West and still seen as kind of a mythical place. So he was there at the right, at the right place. But I wanted to find out. He had descendants, right? Mm -hmm. Were you able to get in touch? Right. Um. He does have uh, descendants who are actually very actively involved in preserving his legacy in Matsue as well as internationally. And I did not get in touch with them because I did not want to write um, a hagiography of Hearn. I wanted to, you know, uh, feel a, a kind of emotional independence from his legacy. And I was concerned that if I met these folks, I would form either an attachment or, you know. Um, but uh, Louise, you're absolutely right about this, this, this uh, phenomenon, right, within Japan of the Westerner, you know. And, and because a Westerner validated something, it's, it's, it seemed, um, by some Japanese as being worthwhile, more worthwhile. And I think with Hearn, there's a particularly interesting sort of twist on that, in that he was writing, you know, the Meiji era in Japan, as you know, it was forward to the West, you know, leave everything behind. And Hearn, Hearn was an absolute, like, um, uh, preservationist. You know, he hated all new things. He hated the city of New York when he was here for like a, a couple of months because it was all new and go and go and, you know. So he, so part of his project in, in writing and documenting the stories that he heard is now sort of often used by very conservative Japanese um, to, to, to kind of, I don't know, shore up the, the, the specialness of Japan, the exceptionalism of Japan, which is really frightening, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and I'll tell you also that Alethea, his African-American wife, is rarely spoken about and written, continues to be written out of his legacy. You know, they'll talk about his Greek origins and they'll talk about his Japanese connection, you know, and, and, and contribution, but rarely, I mean, rarely, Alethea. So I, I kind of feel like that's part of my project, you know, is to bring all these elements uh, together. There is this staggering scene, if I remember correctly, with Alethea, where she says again and again, I need a witness, I need a witness, yeah. and you are her witness. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I try to be. Um, the thing with, um, I, you know, right, writing these stories, um, there is an incredible um, professor uh, at uh, Columbia, named Sadia Hartman. And Sadia uh, Hartman wrote, uh, well, she's written many things, but uh, one of the essays that really has just sort of grounded me in this project is um, called Venus in Two Acts. And she writes about what does it mean, you know, for a writer to attempt to essentially tell the stories that are missing from the archives, meaning the stories of women of color, um, and Sadia Hartman is writing specifically as stories of enslaved women, 
right and she says something that i think is very useful to me um which is that there is an inherent failure to that project you know there's the hunger to know the necessity to know and then just how can you know it's empty the archives is empty um, and only in these rare exceptions that there are these documents where women of color actually appear. And like with Alethea, it's because either of a disaster, you know, or some sort of, I don't know, some, um, I forget exactly the other word she used, like some sort of, like, uh, like um, mistake or, or just, it's kind of luck, luck and disaster, you know, it's between those two, right, that, that you, we end up with a document that tells any small aspect of um, the stories of, ins of the enslaved, the subaltern, the, the folks at the margin. Um, and yet, you know, uh, so Professor Hartman didn't conclude this, but I concluded that I think it's necessary to fail anyway. Do we have other questions? If not, I, I have one more myself, and then I think we'll we'll wrap up. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I do want to mention, um, which you all know, we're in one of the nation's greatest independent booksellers. Um, so to support um, having marvelous authors like Monique here, um, I hope you'll buy many, many copies of her book and get her to uh, sign them for you right here. Um, and my final question is is a line that, that just sort of blew me away, but I'm not entirely sure why, and I'd love to hear you talk about it. And it's something the character Kazu says and he says poets have rem reminiscences mothers have memories right so Katsuo is is there um, is Hearn and Setsu's oldest son and the son that he was most close to right and I and oh and it's so it's very truthful but also very sad and I think one of the reasons why uh, Hearn felt such a connection to his first son was because he looked most like a Westerner. <laughs> um, but uh, at this point in the in the story, he's 15 years old, and he's trying. His mother, asked Setsu, asked him, you know, what is this word reminiscence? And because that that is eventually the title right of of her memoir reminiscence and it was suggested to her uh, at least in the book by uh, an American and um, so her and that's how Katsu uh, sort of explains it and what he really means is there is a gradation right <laughs> there's a valuation where reminiscences are in, are what learned people have people who have achieved men have and mothers what do we have we have memories you know and that really goes back to that ho that that uh, theme right well about you know storytelling versus you know uh, uh, books documenting, writing, publishing. And there are many sort of plays like that that I, I tried to highlight about the gendered nature of storytelling and how women's stories are absolutely dismissed again and again. And I'm just going to give you some, some examples which are not going to like surprise you at all. But think about it, you know, when people say gossip, that's what women do. Women gossip. What do men do? Men have like, you know, like um, community news or the newspaper, the local paper, right? Uh, Hearn was known as an expert on folklore and fairy tales and, and um, oh, rather it's the word folklore. Folklore is really something you become an expert in, right? But really, what are you saying? Ghost stories and fairy tales. Who tells ghost stories and fairy tales? Mothers tell them to their children. You know, go on and on. But um, 
Yeah, so that's what Katsuo, who's very much his father's son, was trying to uh, get his mother to understand. Thank you very much, Monique.